Alright, good morning. Welcome everyone to San Jose Open Bible Sunday online service. I'm super excited to be able to share a message with you and share some hope that we have in Jesus Christ today. Um, as we are looking forward to the new year, um, I'm going to avoid the mistakes that we made in 2020. Uh, going into 2020, we had a sermon series called 2020 Vision. Um, and, you know, I don't know where we went wrong, but just about a month after that sermon series ended, uh, everything kind of hit the fan. And so I'm going to really avoid um, running any 2022 sermon series for this year. In my conversations with Pastor Dwayne and I, we've decided to steer clear of the, the year and the vision title. I think that was really what did us in in the year 2020. And so uh, we're going to go a different direction. But as, we, as I kick off um, our look at the new year, um, I'm just going to share with you guys a little bit some of the things that help me reorient um, my focus and my attention ahead of this new year as I look to, um, to reset some things that are happening in my life. And so as we look at this series or the sermon title for today, um, we're going to be looking at the concept of resetting. What does it look like in our faith and in our personal life when we take a step and slow down and reset? Um, one of the most exciting things about flipping over to a new calendar year um, everything feels refreshed and new, and it feels like any of the baggage, any of the stuff that you've been carrying with you um, for all of the year 2021, you can shed that baggage in the year 2022. It's a new opportunity, it's a new experience, and it's a very exciting time if you had a rough year. And if you had a great year, then great. You get to look forward to an even better year happening the next year. Um, so normally, when we go from one year to the next, it encompasses um, usually some new goals and resolutions and things that we are going to work on to better ourselves. So I'm just going to name a few. I'm sure you have a few online that you've had throughout the years. If you want to throw them in the comments, whether you're watching live as we premiere or whether you're watching later on, feel free to comment some of your New Year's resolutions. Um, some of, of the few that I put together um, typically encompass these four aspects of ourself. Um, typically, it's something that we're working on personally. It's a goal that I have for myself. Um, maybe it's a goal that you may have professionally, whether it's a job or a career change, or to take a step up in that job, or to get better at your job. So professionally, um, we may have goals that really drive us throughout the year. Um, the next section would be spiritually. Oftentimes, we can have spiritual goals or personal goals or something like that. Um, and then we may have communal goals or goals for our church, goals for our family, goals for our community, um, goals that can be accomplished with multiple people, multiple families working together. Um, and so as, as we have those four things, I'm sure you guys can think of some other ways in which you may have had goals in the past or maybe have a goal for this year. Um, and we get to choose to better ourselves and we get to choose what those goals are. Um, a, little more, a little more straight to the point, um, oftentimes it's involved around health and fitness and maybe involving um, maybe a spouse or a child. Um, maybe it's involving um, living healthier, eating healthier, uh, working out more, getting a new hobby, um, spending less money, making more money. These are all things that I feel like everyone can kind of um, can get, can understand. Maybe you've had one or all those things um, in the same year. And so those are some stuff that I've had personally for my own goals. Um, if you have your own goals for this upcoming year, feel free to throw those out there. Um, and I'm interested to see what everyone's goals are for this upcoming year. Um, but as we, um, as we look at those things, those are often called our New Year's resolutions. And I don't know about you all, but oftentimes New Year's resolutions can be very exciting and they can also be something that you dread just a few days into the new year. Oftentimes you see gyms that are packed the first few days of the year and then that crowd slowly and slowly falls off and dies off. And New Year's resolutions don't always have a great connotation to them because it often represents um, just the first few weeks of, uh, of January um, as you're getting into trying to create new habits for yourself. It's very easy to fall back into old habits and so oftentimes New Year's resolutions um, Oftentimes up to 80% can fall off very, very quickly within the first two to three weeks. Um, it's very hard to stick out New Year's resolutions because you're trying to rework and reset habits you've been forming your entire life. 
Um, but I would say the beautiful thing about New Year's resolutions is when you are able to stick with it, um, it becomes that much sweeter when you're able to hit that um, goal that you've set for yourself. And so nothing wrong with New Year's resolutions, but oftentimes they can become very strenuous and they become very hard for us to follow through on. Um, and so as I look at this new year, the frame that I have been using um, has been to reset. Um, and that is emotionally, um, spiritually, in my professional life, in my personal life, I've been looking at what does it mean to reset and recalibrate what I'm doing um, so that I'm better as a person, as a husband, as a father, um, as a pastor, as well as as a friend. And so when I look at what it means to reset, um, we're going to take a look at what it meant for Jesus, the way that he modeled what it means to reset and renew and refocus what he was doing. And so I figured there's no better way um, than to go to the word and look at the examples that Jesus gave us on how that we can follow through in our resolutions and in our reset into the new year. Um, oftentimes, we don't follow through with resolutions because we feel like if we mess it up the first time, that's it, game over, we'll come back and get them next year. And it can become an out for us to not have to really feel like we have a consistent um, commitment to the goals that we're setting in our life. So I just wanna encourage you all um, that as we are going into looking at what it means to reset and set these goals for ourselves spiritually and personally, um, to not feel like those goals are piling on and adding on to things that we're already doing, but I actually want to look at resetting and frame it in a way of, instead of adding on and making things harder, to take things away that are adding stress and stuff to our lives. So when we look at this, we're bound to have ups and downs in any goal that we set, but we need to be prepared just like Jesus was. So we need to have a plan and we need to follow through with that plan. Now, in order to have a plan and to be prepared, we have to take a step back from what we're doing. And so the first thing I want to look at is what does it mean to take a step back? What does it mean to rest and recalibrate our life in order to refocus it on God and refocus it on the call that God has on our life? Oftentimes, our goals and our New Year's resolutions are things that are more physical um, or monetary or something that we can touch. Um, but I want to reframe our reset in more of a spiritual sense. What are things that we can do to rest and take a step back spiritually that will help us be refreshed and renewed going into a new year? Some ideas that I had for myself. Um, I'm going to talk about myself a little bit. But the idea of praying for a friend every day, whether that's the same friend or a new friend or multiple friends, to take the time away to not focus on myself and to really pray for friends in Christ, friends that don't know Christ, in order to take that time away from myself, away from my cell phone, away from whatever game I'm watching on TV, um, and really put others first. Another thing that I had on my list was to take the time to appreciate that all God has given me and blessed me with. I think oftentimes I get so caught up in wanting and needing more that I forget all that God has already given me and blessed me with. And so it can be hard to appreciate that in the moment. So taking a step back, um, retreating from my very busy everyday life and, and focusing on that is a goal that I have for myself. That time to recharge and then also spending time alone and alone time not just being spent for the sake of being alone, but for the sake of reconnecting to my faith, reconnecting with God, just like Jesus did. As we look at what Jesus did, we have to understand that he's the perfect example of what it means to follow God, to love others, um, and to connect with the people around him. And so it can be very daunting to look at that example and, and know that we are falling short in the ways that we're trying. But I just want to say, let's give ourselves some grace as we are doing the best we can to be like Jesus and follow Jesus. When we look at our culture today, um, I would say rest, relaxation, recharge, renew, restore. Those are all things that go against what our culture pushes in a very materialistic way. Our culture is pushing us to do more, to earn more, to buy more, to produce more, to do more. As we get those pressures from every single avenue of our life, from our media, to our work, to our community around us, um, it can be very daunting and stressful and anxiety-inducing 
to feel like we have to keep up with what everyone else is doing and to keep the same pace that everyone else is keeping. And so I want to say this, instead of trying to go at the pace of everyone else, to take that step back, to reset our pace, and to go at the pace that God has called us to, and oftentimes that's slower, but if we can have that pace with consistency, we can get to where God has called us to go. In Ephesians 2, chapter 10, it says, For we are all God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This shows us that we are God's, that he has already called us his children, that we belong to him, and the things that we are going to do, he has already prepared for us, he already knows what we're going to do. He's already established this is going to happen. So all we need to do is be obedient and faithful to the call that he has put on our lives. And that doesn't mean we have to go faster, do more, work harder, produce more, be more, earn more, the same way that our society tells us that's where our value lies. Because the Bible tells us and Christ Jesus tells us that our value is already established. We are already his handiwork which I wouldn't want to be anyone else's. We already have our value has been bought and paid for, and we don't have to earn it. We don't have to work for it. We don't have to hit a certain milestone at a certain time. We don't have to hit our numbers, but his, the, the way that he has provided for us is enough, and we can rest, and we can take a deep breath, and know that we are his. And I think that is the most freeing verse I read this week. When I look at the idea that my value does not rest or rely on what I can produce, what I can do, who I am, how good I am at what I do, but my value is set in stone by Christ who has called me his and I can know that he is for me and that he is for everything that he has called me to do. He has a pre position and predisposed me to have the ability to do those things. And so I can rest easy. I can take a deep breath to know that he has provided a way for me and I don't have to earn. I don't have to be good enough to follow the call that he has on my life. I just have to be obedient. So as we reset in the year 2022, I think this is a call to us personally. And I think this is a call to us as a church. COVID has been um, a very interesting and wild, wild ride um, these last few years. Um, and it can be daunting to try to figure out how to navigate. Should I be in person? Should I be online? Should I come sometimes? Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I go out to eat with friends? Should I just stay home all the time? Should I only meet with friends who meet certain criteria or in my bubble? And with the, the rising cases, it's even more stressful for us to try to make the choices that we need to make to protect ourselves and protect our family. And I think it's just a lot of uncertainty the last few years. And as a church, I think we have definitely felt that um, with our members online, with our members who have met in person. Um, and for our greater community, it has definitely been a daunting and confusing time to try to figure out how to navigate all these things that are happening as things unfold in peaks and valleys and spiking cases and lowered cases. Um, it's been a, a journey to figure out how we navigate these waters. But I want to say that I think in everything that we do, um, it's so important to look to Jesus to see how he did these things because when we can look at the way that he modeled and navigated difficult times it can give us insight on how we can do that ourselves in jesus's time he didn't start performing miracles right out the womb and i think it's kind of kind of funny that the message is going here today because as we wrap up today i'm recording um on christmas eve and getting ready for our, our christmas eve service that's going to be um in just a few hours and we're going to talk about the birth and the coming of christ the savior and oftentimes, we talk about the birth of Christ, and then we skip completely to his ministry from age 30 to 33, leading up to Easter and the death of Christ and his resurrection. And then we talk a lot about the New Testament, but we, we often skip over um, everything else that's in between. And to be fair, the Bible doesn't have a whole lot about that time. There's a few stories that talk about Christ in those times. Um, but when we look at that, it's very interesting to see that Christ's ministry started right around the age of 30. Because for me personally, I'm, I'm getting closer to 30, just hit 29. And, and as I look at that age, I realize that whatever I've done so far with my life, 
nothing really counts until 30 because Jesus didn't really start his like main ministry till 30. So I'm good. Um, gives me another um, another year or so to kind of really get prepared. Um, but as I as I look at that, I realize that Christ wasn't just hanging out for the first 30 years of his life, but he was preparing for the journey that God was calling him to. He knew that there was a ministry was happening and this, this was all going to really build up in the next few years. And so he prepared his way and he prepared himself and he prepared his body with learning and growing physically, spiritually, mentally. And those are all things that he did to prepare himself. And it, and it all comes to a head right as he is starting his ministry. But the Bible has a really cool story and it talks about Jesus as a child, as a 12-year-old. Um, as I read this story again this morning, um, I just couldn't help but laugh as I um, walked into the house um, and my wife Jackie was watching the movie Home Alone and I'm sure most of us has pro have probably seen it, um, but she had not seen it until today. Today was the first time. Every time she says she hadn't seen it before, I make fun of her because I just couldn't believe that she hadn't seen Home Alone at any point. Um, and so I, as I see um, this movie Home Alone playing as, as we're kind of getting ready for the day um, this morning, I just laughed because I was thinking about the story of Jesus where it has a young boy, his parents are going on vacation, one person thinks he's in their car, the other person thinks he's in the other car, they get all the way to the airport, I believe they get already off the plane, and you just hear the sheer terror as they realize that their son has been left at home, he did not make the trip to the airport, did not get on the plane, and I don't know how that happens even in a big family, but, um, but there was clearly a mistake, so the rest of the movie I won't spoil it, even though it's about 20 or 30 years old. So if you haven't seen it by now, it's kind of your fault. But the rest of the movie plays out of him trying to protect himself, stay at home, and the family trying to get back to him. And there's a story of Jesus as a 12-year-old, and his parents pack up their caravan. They go back home, or they go on to the next town. And it was a whole day's journey before they realized he wasn't with them. And I don't know what this conversation with God must have been like because you have been now entrusted, Mary, you know, fantastic, Joseph, fantastic. You've been trusted to raise the savior of this world. So they have been entrusted with someone that is very, very valuable and very important. And I would say every single person is valuable and important. But I mean, preteen Jesus is, I, I would say, up there as just absolutely, just can't lose him. You can't leave him behind. Um, but but they did, they made a mistake. So a whole day's journey. So this is gonna spend two days, whole day's journey there. They had to have the whole day's journeys back. And when they get to the temple, you see preteen Jesus in all of his glory in the center or in the quad area. And he was doing a few different things. He was, he was listening, he was teaching, and he was communicating with the other teachers and leaders in that area. And as, as this young man, you know, Jesus, he could have just been there to only teach. It's Jesus. He could have just taught and not given any sort of, um, not taken any sort of feedback or not have put anything, um, put anything out there as far as learning. But it says that he was intentional in his hearing in the way that he listened, in the way that he learned, asking questions from these elders and leaders. And that is such um, a cool example that I don't think I really have paid attention to much. But as a youth pastor um, and as a young, you know, young millennial, um, oftentimes we um, take a little bit of flack as millennials, um, as people that are just hard headed and probably true, um, or people that, you know, don't really listen to the older generation, probably true. I would say that's true with probably every generation. Um, but as we look at those questions, it, Jesus's humility to listen and learn from other teachers and leaders, as well as to teach them and to share with them, shows me the value that community brings in our faith community, in our church, and the value of older generations to be able to speak and encourage the young people in our churches. And that is something that I think we miss so much when we get so caught up on our preference and we get so caught up in how we want to do things. We have to understand that 
We all have value in teaching one another. Sometimes I'll need to be corrected. Sometimes it may be you. It probably will never be you, mostly just me. But sometimes there's correction that needs to happen. Or teaching may, may not even be correcting, but it may be learning and growing in our faith. And I know that as a young, um, young adult right out of high school into you know, early college, um, oftentimes I felt like I had it all figured out. Theologically, um, I had it all figured out. I knew all the stuff. I heard all the stories. I grew up in church. I was in youth group. Um, I read books and I read the Bible and I read books about the Bible, books about books about books about the Bible. And I felt like I had it mostly under control. I knew there was still stuff I had to learn, but I feel like I had my base was rock solid. And in some cases it was. But oftentimes it took me stepping outside of my framework and my theological understanding to realize that other people had studied and put much more time and effort into understanding things that I just had a very surface knowledge of. And when I started to understand that I didn't have it all figured out, I didn't know everything, but that there were other people out there who could bring value to my theological training, to my humility, to who I was as a person, who had insight through their experience that I hadn't understood yet because of my hard-headedness and because of my pride and thinking that I had it all figured out. Um, I would, I would say that it was very easy to be um, prideful in the fact that, you know what, I've studied this. If someone was coming in and had less Bible knowledge than me or less understanding of a certain passage or a scripture, that I would feel um, maybe arrogant or hard-headed in the fact that I already know it. Please don't come tell me um, you know, what you think it means because I already have my own opinions that I've made and that I've set in stone. And when I started to get rid of those... Um, opinions and started to get rid of those presuppositions that I know what I'm talking about more than anyone else, I started to learn and grow in a really deep way. So as I reset my faith, oftentimes, I was learning from people that I hadn't allowed myself to be, um, to learn from previously. I hadn't allowed myself to be willing to hear from because I felt like I already knew more. I already knew better than whatever they were telling me. And when I see preteen Jesus, 12 year old Jesus, have a willingness to learn and grow from other teachers, and this is Jesus, how could I, myself, not be able to listen and learn as well from other people, from other pastors, from other elders, from other teens and youth um, who have so much wisdom and value? Um, oftentimes we can feel like we know better just because we're older. We know better just because we spent more time in church. But oftentimes Jesus uses people who have no connection to church or very little theological or spiritual training to give us some of the deepest lessons that we learn. So as we take our time to be intentional in our reset and renewing of our faith and our rest, it's really important that we understand that we don't have to do. Alice Walker said this, she said, you don't always have to be doing something, you can just be. And I think the permission that Jesus gives us to just be, to just rest, to just soak up his presence and soak up who he is, um, is a very freeing and a very um, relaxing, it kind of lets my shoulders untense so I can take a deep breath to understand that Jesus says you can just be, you can just be in my presence, you can just be with me. Because oftentimes, I know I have felt throughout the years, the idea that to rest means I'm not being productive and I'm not doing enough in my faith. It pushes against the desire for me to perform for God, to be good enough for him to earn extra love, to earn extra praise, to earn extra responsibility in his church, to earn his affection, to earn um, positions, to earn privilege, to earn all these things. My desire at times even if unknowingly was, if I do good enough at this, then other people will notice that how good of a Christian I am, how, how well I'm able to do the things that God has called me to do. And instead of doing them for God, I do them for other people around me to notice that I'm doing them for God. And I think oftentimes we can find ourselves very quickly there when we get the praise or the adoration or the congratulations for things that we're able to do. It's really important that we bring it back and root all the things that we're doing and the fact that we're doing them for God through the gifts that he has given us. As I close with this, I want to say that to be intentional 
in rooting out the bad practices in our lives, um, Jesus gives us this example and the way that he did this in his life. And it's, a, and it's this, it's three things. It's to rest, to learn, and to do. Jesus um, oftentimes was resting or retreating away from large crowds of people during his time in ministry to recharge, to reset, to communicate with God and have alone and solitude time in his faith and his personal communication with God. After a large gathering, 5,000 plus people, he retreats to the other side of the lake. On the boat, you know, with his disciples, resting and sleeping while there's a storm going on, um, Jesus was the ultimate napper. And he often gives, um, you know, gives very, uh, very good advice um, for how to handle these things that goes against what my personal, uh, what my personal advice would be. Um, my, my personal advice or my personal pull is always to do, how to perform. There's a storm going on, let me get up right away and, and you know, help everyone out. You know, there's a, there's a house party going on with Mary and Martha. Let me make sure everything is clean, everything is done, everything is prepared for our guests. And oftentimes Jesus has said, hey, take a, take a deep breath, relax, and just be here in the moment, in this very special time. And so I would just say rest is number one. Jesus oftentimes gives us um, a great picture of what it looks like to pull away from the crowd, pull away from the busyness, and just rest and reset. Like I talked about earlier, it's important that we learn. Like I said, in Luke 21, 2, 41 through 52, Jesus, left for a whole day, is listening, asking, and answering questions from other teachers and leaders. We haven't figured it all out yet. We don't know. If Jesus is still learning at a young age, then what makes us think that we can't also learn, whether we're young or old, older? What makes us think that we have arrived um, when, you know, I'm just, I mean, Jesus. When you compare to Jesus and Jesus is learning and growing, how can I think that I've ever gotten to that point where I'm better than where Jesus was at? And then doing. Jesus often talks about his time in ministry where it wasn't his time yet, it wasn't his time yet, it wasn't his time yet. As things were happening, he'd perform miracles. He would tell people, please, not yet. Please don't go tell anyone what's happened in those first few miracles. Please, you know, don't go sharing this with everyone yet. It is not quite time. My time has not come yet. And then very quickly after that, his time had come, and he would perform miracles, and they would share with towns, and people would come from all over, and he would be mobbed and crowded with thousands of people, 5,000 men he's feeding. Um, people all across the countryside, all across cities packed, following him on streets. Um, so Jesus is going through these things, and the cycle would continue. A crazy event would occur. He would get away to rest recalibrate, restructure his day, restructure his time, and reset what he was doing. Okay, his, the process of learning was continuing, and he was doing. So he was constantly in prayer, in communion with God, and then his ministry would continue. So as he would rest and then do, rest and then do, he would never be going 100 miles an hour full bore, but he was constantly taking that time to rest. And if Jesus is taking that time to rest, we have permission to take that time to rest for ourselves. So as we look at what it means to restore and to reset, and we look at that theme for this week, to reset our faith, I want to encourage you and challenge you to take something out and put something in. If you're going to have something that you're going to push yourself to be better at, find something spiritually that you can have a goal for this year. What is that goal for you going to be? Is that reading your Bible? Is that taking time in prayer daily? Is that spending time worshiping by yourself? Is that spending time, whatever it is, that time that you are picking for something to help you develop and grow spiritually? So pick one thing to add to your plate to help you grow and develop in your faith. And then I want you to pick one thing as we reset. Pick one thing that's a practice or a habit or something that you have happening in your life that you need to take out to remove because to reset, we often have to remove the things that are messing up our spiritual life and our spiritual practice. So to add something in and take something out, just like Jesus did, constantly being in, um, taking, taking inventory of where we're at in our quiet time with God, 
and resetting to make sure that we are focused on what he's called us to do and that we can be focused on the mission that he has given us. I'm going to close with that. Um, as we go to worship, um, I just want to encourage you to take some time during worship and as, we're, as you're singing or listening, um, not to just log off um, once this message is over, not to just move on with your day without giving it a second thought, but I want you to take out a piece of paper, write a note in your phone, um, type a comment, whatever you feel comfortable with, um, but to hold yourself accountable to what you are adding or subtracting to your spiritual practice, to your daily practice, to help you reset and refocus our spiritual life with God. So take a moment while we're doing this and write something down. Um, pick, put on a little slip of paper, put it in your wallet, put it on a phone note, send a text to someone so they can keep you accountable with that thing. Um, but I really want to encourage you to take that step because when you take that step and you take that action, you take that step of faith, it really helps us follow through with what we're doing. So as I close in prayer, um, please stick, stay with us for worship, and um, I hope you have a great and wonderful time before the New Year's. Dear Jesus, thank you for all that you've given us, all that you've done for us. I just pray that we would reset, that we would recalibrate our faith to be focused on you, to give ourselves a break, to rest and restore um, all the, the weariness that we may be going through after a tough, busy holiday season. I pray that you would just restore us, renew us, and give us a reset in our spiritual life and in our life. See you next week. Amen. All right. Have a great day.
word, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. When I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work. Even when I don't feel it, you work it. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Way make miracle work. Promise keeper, light in the darkness. darkness, my God, that is who you